Thank you so much. So the moderator for our next panel on energy policy is Rick Moroz. Rick and I worked together when he was the president of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities from 2014 to 2018. He's the founder and managing director of Resolute Strategies and as well as Senior Director for Strategic and Regulatory Affairs at Archer Public Affairs in Trenton. Rick has had a long career in law and government service and is an advocate for securing and making the energy grid more resilient from cyber and physical attacks. Rick is an advisor to industry leaders and a commentator on energy and security issues. So Rick, my friend, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Regina, and thanks for having me. And, and I want to congratulate you on all the great work that GSI is doing. And uh, we wanted to uh, uh, have a bit of a discussion today, but also ask, answer your questions about the energy transition that's occurring, occurring here as well as nationally, the implications to all of us, including the economy and ultimately to customers. Um, I just wanna make a couple of real quick comments. The first of which is uh, something that Regina didn't say, many of you know, I've been in and out of state government for many years. I served as the president of the Board of Public Utilities most recently, but quite a few years ago, I served as the chief counsel to Christy Whitman when she was the governor of New Jersey. And during that period of time, while I was her chief counsel, she signed the Deregulation Act. We are a restructured state here amongst others in the Northeast. And that was an attempt at the time, by the way, to confront what was and what continues to be a burden to business, which is the high cost of energy. At that time, back in the 1990s, there were industrial and commercial customers largely that were moving to the South. They wanted to move their operations because of the high cost of energy. That was a primary reason for restructuring. So we had an energy transition 20 years ago with a restructuring of markets that allowed for that to happen in a competitive environment, that started to have its own challenges. And then just over the last 10 years, we started to see another transition, a transition that's coming from technology, but really being driven by other policies, other public policies, public policies for environmental issues, largely to reduce emissions. Not that I'm arguing that that's bad, but that has been becoming a driver of our energy policy. So today we wanna to talk about a couple of things. Uh, have some discussion about how this transition is occurring, not just here, but uh, throughout the country, and how that technology is working because industry leaders largely say they can accommodate a lot of those transitions to newer forms of energy generation, particularly renewable energies, maybe about to 70 or 75% of getting to the goals, but that last 20% is both technologically a challenge and very expensive. So we wanna talk about the policies, the technologies, and how this transition is occurring across the country and the implications to New Jersey and to cost. Now, I've always said that I thought that the best policy is to have energy policy that allows for the most abundant sources of energy possible with the least emissions at the lowest cost. And that is a very difficult thing to get all of those things just right, but that's hopefully where we can go or where we, we, we should try to do. But we're gonna ask our panelists today that we've asked to come here today, experts in this field. Uh, first, Travis Fisher, uh, a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, he has a long history uh, uh, representing industry, including some large industrial users in, in an association, as well as having posts at the DOE and at FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, David Hill, senior research scholar at the Global Energy Policy Institute at Columbia University, former general counsel at NRG, also former general counsel at the Department of Energy. David, it's great to see you. And uh, Matt Kiesling. Matt is a senior vice president of the American Gas Association and has spent many years in DC working for trade associations around this issue. Matt deals with state government affairs for the American Gas Association. So let's get right to it. I should also mention David Hill, who I wanna to go to first, is also a board member at the New York State Independent Service Operator, the grid operator for the state of New York. And I wanna bring this question maybe first to him because right next door, New York has been at this issue of the transition for the better part of about a decade, actively. 
and is a single state grid operator and then has single state regulation. So David, why don't you tell us how, maybe from that perspective, the transition has been going in New York, what the issues are and the challenges that you've been experiencing. Thank you, Rick, and uh, uh, good to see everybody here today. You know, before I answer your question, I of course have to have to say something else, which is, you know, my, my current title is senior research scholar. I mean, you know, I don't think of myself as senior. I don't do research and whether or not I'm really a scholar or not is pretty debatable. Yeah. I, um, you know, I'm a lawyer. I, I, as Rick was saying, I've spent most of my career I've been both in private practice in-house and, and also in the government. Um, and I've been, been involved in, uh, and so I've been both in, in policy side of things and, uh, and working inside the government and also been on the outside and having to live with the rules um, that the government makes. As, as a result, I, I'm actually a big, you know, the, the revolving door gets bad mouth, but I'm actually a big fan of it because I think the people in the government actually need to, you need people in the government who have had to live with the rules and you need to people in the government who have to go out and live with the rules that they've dealt with. On, on that score, I mean, hearing uh, Dr. Lafford uh, talk, you know, and talking about the uh, tax rates and things like that, I, I, I was reminded of a, of a, of a quote from H.L. Mencken. I don't know if any of you all are familiar with him, but, you know, one of the muckraking journalists from back in the early 20th century with Baltimore Sun. Um, every election is a sort of advance auction sale of stolen goods. <laughs> I, I want you to know he said that and I didn't. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it actually is, is uh, extracting good policy out of any administration, is a, is a, uh, whether federal or state, is actually really hard. I think, so in New York, what we've got going on, as Rick mentioned, the, the New York State uh, NISO, the New York Independent System Operator, is, is a, an independent system operator. It's a single state ISO. It's regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It's also regulated in some respects by the state. Here in New Jersey, we also have an independent system operator. It's PJM. That independent system operator is a multi-state operator. So it's, uh, it, op it, it operates the, the wholesale electric power market and the interstate transmission system for a number of different states. Um, all, all the way back to Chicago, down to Virginia, um, Indiana, District of Columbia, um, uh, Pennsylvania, a lot of states. In New York, New York has very aggressive carbon reduction goals. Um, the uh, New York State passed the law called the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act when uh, Cuomo was still governor. That uh, calls for the electricity sector to be 70% renewable by 2030 and 100% emission free, uh, zero emission by 2040. Now, New York State is starting in a different position than most other states. Right now, right before I walked up here, I looked at what the current energy mix supply, the energy supplying the state of New York right now is roughly 50% emission free <clears throat> or zero emission. Now, what is that? You know, what that is, is it's hydro and it's nuclear with a little bit of wind um, and a tiny bit of solar. Uh, so New York starts in a different position than most of the rest of the states in the country, and certainly in a different position than, than uh, New Jersey does in getting to, to um, uh, emission reduction goals. I mean, there are some very aggressive things that are out there, uh, both in terms of emission reduction, as well as getting the new units to retire. And frankly, the, the, the biggest reliability challenges are not the additional renewables that are coming on the system, it's the retirement of the, of the units that are already there that you need in order to maintain reliability. Because the, and, and particularly the gas units, frankly. Um, uh, and so the studies that, and you can find these studies on the website, uh, NISO, New York Independent System Operators Studies, in order to actually get to the, to the renewable or to the zero emission goals, We've got to build a massive amount of resource, but you can't. You cannot retire the uh, the existing fossil resource, particularly the gas resource, until the new resources on are online, and that's going to take a number of years. Now, speaking of gas, you're talking about the electric generation largely, David, uh, and that mix. But um, what about gas? So I want to I want to 
asked this question. People are asking it. Uh, we're having an enhanced discussion here in New Jersey about the future of gas. But this is a conversation going on all over the country. Matt Kiesling with the American Gas Association. Uh, tell, give us a sense of what's happening across this, the country. What's the future of gas? Is it going away? Can it go away? And, and what's that future look like? Yeah, thanks, Richard. So uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, so American Gas Association, we represent a little over 200 uh, in largely investor-owned natural gas utilities uh, across the, the country. So, so end-use natural gas for uh, cooking, hot water, heating, heating of your home, uh, as well as business and manufacturing uh, in large part. Um, so I, look, I, I think when folks say is natural gas going away, I mean, the natural gas system since 2019 has added more than one and a half million customers across the country. It's more than a customer a minute. Um, if you look at it nationwide, ironically enough, uh, if you look at the top five states, both California and uh, New Jersey are inside that that bubble of, of being the top five additions in, in customers since 2019 across the country. And so is it is it going away? I don't, I don't think that the answer is is yes or, or no. I think it's going to have to change and it's going to have to adapt. And I think that's really um, what we're seeing across our industry is, you know, the the challenge of this this transition um, conversation is that somewhere along the way it, it, it kind of got co-opted and we decided that electrification equal decarbonization. And those are two very different things um, when we talk about it. Right. So electrification of of, you know, your home or electrification of vehicles, however we talk about that, um, that's one thing. Decarbonizing our energy system is a completely different dynamic, you know, and, and we've sort of proven that out. Our, our companies have proven that out, that out since 1990. Uh, you know, we've had nearly 70 percent emissions reduction across our the distribution system, the natural gas distribution system. Um, and we've tripled the, the amount of pipeline over that period of time. And so what our industry is proving time and time again is that you can keep decarbonizing, you can keep getting cleaner, you can keep reducing emissions. Um, and get to some of the goals that we want to achieve without, you know, essentially scrapping the entire natural gas system. You know, we just had a number of, uh, of pieces of legislation pass in, in Washington, whatever you may or may not think about IIJA and IRA, but there's over $9 billion in hydrogen funding in those. And, uh, you know, we've, our members have two and a half million miles of pipeline across the country. And so there's going to have to be a way to transport hydrogen at the end of the day. And, and so, really thinking about how do we use what's available uh, with, without sort of reinventing the wheel is going to be a, a big piece of how I think we, we make things move in the future. And so, no, I don't, don't think the gas system is going away. Okay. Actually. And you make a great point that it's worth leveraging the infrastructure that we already have uh, and building upon it for these new technologies that can be, can be introduced and find the synergies. Uh, Travis Fisher at Heritage, you are spending a lot of time on the public policy issues, the economic policy issues confronting and, and, and around the industry. You've also uh, represented large users and been in the business. Uh, tell us uh, how is particularly business embracing this transition writ large across the country and and how can how can business do that? So I see it as the, the business community in general looks at a wide variety of things. So they, they, there's no one answer to that. I think what they like, what the two things that they like for sure, low rates, high reliability. So those two things sometimes are at odds, but then you add this third thing, which is the sustainability element, the environmental policy element, that can throw both of the other ones for a loop. So that, then the question is, how do you do that and how do you accommodate what the business needs specifically? When you look at the different sectors, some have very stringent goals and some just don't. So I've, I've talked to folks, I'm not going to name names because this is in the don't category. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the folks that I've talked to who don't care about sustainability per se, they say, if you can give me power for three cents per kilowatt hour, reliable, cheap power, I don't care if you're communist China, I'll go wherever. I'll go wherever for that three cent power. Some folks take that view. Some folks take the, oh, we have to account for every hour of our use. We have to do it. This is more like the, the Google view of the world, which is 24 seven carbon free energy, all that stuff. So I think what is crucial here is to allow for the optionality piece for the third thing, which not everybody agrees on. Everybody wants the cheap, 
reliable, of course, let's, let's focus on that. And then let's allow for optionality on the other end, which by the way, you don't have in states that mandate a transition to net zero, because then that sort of takes off the table the companies that don't necessarily prioritize that. Mm -hmm. hey, Rick, yep. if I could just follow up on your, your question too to, to Travis. I, I think to me from the business community, one of the most important things is transparency about the cost. Where are the costs? Where are, what, what actually is the cost of this policy decision? And where, and where are those costs? I'll, I'll tell you, I think that they're within the, the, the power sector in particular, but the energy industry kind of writ large. Um, Travis and I were just emailing back and forth about this just in the last day. It's, it's, I, I think there, are, there is so much of so much, uh, some of the time, sort of the battle of subsidies. It's sort of like, well, they're getting a subsidy. Now I want my subsidy. And the po there are policymakers that are sort of in whatever camp they're in. And so now you've got this battle of subsidies and everybody's getting their subsidy. And then, and then the, the, the actual consumers who are paying for it all, they're gonna pay for it all through either the cost of a product, a tax, a non-bypassable charge, Usually something that's hidden, you know, that's not called a tax because that's a bad word. So we'll, well, it'll be hidden somewhere else, um, and and so. But the consumers are going to pay for it all. And I think that one of the real one of, one of the real keys to making an energy transition that is actually consumer friendly is making cost transparent so consumers and voters can actually make an informed decision about it. And unfortunately, I think there's a lot going on throughout the country that, that is not doing that. So let, let's talk about that, that cost issue. Um, and, and you're right, uh, David, that uh, the cost is, you know, includes a lot of variables. And now with additional attributes that we are in policy uh, now either bound to or people want to have, uh, that is an environmental, meaning low carbon attribute, uh, a reliability attribute, and then the cost of the delivery are we really even there to have that transparency? And is that what we should be doing across the board? And how do we do that? Travis, uh, your thoughts on that? I've got a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> not, most of them are not good. The, uh, what, what I've seen is we, we need to call people when they try to hide the cost. I think that's, that's an important thing because I think people are doing it in bad faith. A great example is the California model. You see the same thing in Germany where you basically have subsidies so it, it it rolls the cost of the grid over into the tax rolls and that's that's where it gets that's a very slippery slope and then what california is doing this is an extra step which i recommend no one do ever is put the cost of the grid into a an income based strata so then it's sort of a you, you're paying your power bill not based on either your consumption or you know it, anything that actually matters on the electricity grid then it's it's, it's turning into this pure subsidy paradigm where, you know, if, if we're not even feeling the cost of our own policies and if we're hiding it to the extent that, you know, it's ending up in the tax base instead, uh, I, that's where we're trending. And I, I, I just would sort of flag that as a, hey, let's not go down that road. Transparent, always better. That's not the direction we're going right now, though, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Matt, do you have any thoughts on the, the cost issue just generally uh, uh, and how we, how we value these, these attributes? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, that one of the challenges, look, I mean, it's, it's great to have a lot of folks at the table talking about what we should be doing going forward. And obviously, you know, for our members, sustainability is, is, is a part of, of what folks are thinking about. Emissions reduction is a part of what folks are thinking about. But, but our big three are always safety, reliability, and affordability, right? Like, that's where we start. And so those are the three right off the top. Uh, and so when you've got folks at the table who don't necessarily favor any of those three as their number one priority, there's an impact, there's an, an inevitable impact uh, on cost. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it, we need to work with, with our regulators in order to address those issues. But, you know, increasingly there are more and more voices at the table and, and you know, inevitably that's having an impact on, on policy and inevitably that policy is having an impact on cost. So um, let's maybe, uh, shift this conversation just slightly to look at the emerging technologies and these costs and benefit issues. Uh, there are great uh, reasons to be deploying renewables. Uh, the, the, the zero carbon issue in first and foremost, but they are in intermittent resources. 
they only work part of the day. Solar during while well, the sun's shining, wind also largely probably part of the day. Uh, and then other technologies like storage, like large scale energy storage, the technology hasn't yet evolved. So how do we try to get that cost, those incentives, whether it's for the generation technology itself, the commodity, or even to support the emerging nature of that technology, how do we get those incentives right? What do we start to do to build that case? I don't know, David, you, you've probably spent some time thinking about these issues and maybe even putting them into practice. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll take a shot at it, Rick. I, the, the first thing that needs to be done with respect to, to technologies is they need to be accredited, in my view, they need to be accredited the right way in the way the market works. We actually pushed this through in New York um, within the last a uh, year and a half or so about, it's, it's a somewhat complex concept called uh, marginal accreditation of capacity. And basically what the, that is, is that if you're, what, what your, your, uh, your facility, how that's gonna be accredited in the capacity market, essentially what you're gonna get paid, it takes into account what service you're going to supply, where you can supply it, how much you can supply it, in what way. It's not like just because you build a unit somewhere and you just get to crank out you know, uh, megawatts that you just get paid the same thing. No, that's not the way the, the, the grid doesn't work that way. And so you, what you, you really need are you need certain um, kinds of generation in certain places that will run at certain times in certain ways. You know, in the end, the electrons flow according to the laws of physics. Not markets, not economics, they flow according to the laws of physics. And how is it that you're gonna get those, the right, the optimal set of facilities built in the places you want them? I think the, to me, the, the, the marginal accreditation of capacity, which again, we're able to pull off in New York, basically, because a single state ISO, you know, I mean, it's much tougher, you know, when you've got a multi-state ISO, the other thing is you need to make sure that the energy is priced the right way so that the people who are producing it when it's needed are going to get paid the rate that they need to get paid. You touched on this earlier, Rick, about the uh, about, you know, energy, about how that some of the time of, of where it's priced. I don't know how many people un understand or know that there are a lot of hours in a place like Texas where the price of wholesale power is below zero. It's negative. You think, well, how can that possibly be? I mean, the wind can be free, but it's not less than free. Um, oh yeah, actually it can be. Um, and the reason is because of the federal tax credits. So uh, a wind facility earns a federal tax credit if they're producing, um, mm -hmm. if, if you're producing wind energy. Um, and so the price in any number of hours in Texas is below zero. I mean, but the, the the thing is, you, you need to have the right facilities built in the right places. And I think that's mm -hmm. how you get the, an optimally right set of generating yeah. resources. Go ahead, Travis. So I, I do want to echo David's, I, I would characterize that as like a, a textbook answer. I mean, the, the sort of the FERC approach is you establish the need. So you have a reliability planning need. You need, you know, a certain amount of megawatts, you know for sure, five years from now. So you, you sort of establish the need. And then what you would do is in a least cost resource neutral way, try to meet that need. The trouble that I see is a lot of states are abandoning a resource neutral approach and going, oh, I know exactly what we need. Uh, I believe the governor here said exactly what we need is 11 gigawatts of offshore wind. <laughs> that is the most expensive way to go about it. So uh, I would abandon the resource specific way of doing things and say, look, if, if you even if you want to characterize it as zero emissions, characterize that as sort of a, you know, a, a characteristic of, of the thing that you need. But be open-ended about what it is that can come and fill that. That opens the window to small modular reactors. We, we, we're seeing a lot of growth in the nuclear energy space. Uh, I don't know whether to be bullish on that or not. I think the only way to find out is to go down that path and see how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, onshore wind, relatively cheap, solar PV. I mean, all of these things can play a role, but really, and you know, we, we should be working on battery storage too. But the way to do it is in a resource neutral way, not to go and say, I know specifically where I want this offshore wind plant to be. So let's talk about that aspect. And I have said this, and I think you touched on exactly an issue that is a bit of a failure 
in the in years past, the planning of the grid would have would have been done in a combination, a collaborative way with the industry, uh, the policymakers, regulators. But now the policymakers have been the ones that really have been driving, particularly the determination on the kind of resource to put in place or the amount of it. Yeah. Is that a problem? It sound, tra Travis, you're saying it, you clearly think it is. I've seen both sides of this problem, to be honest. Uh, so uh, in 2017, the Trump DOE was very big on sort of reviving the coal industry. I think there's a natural inclination. If you're a politician, you want to go and basically fulfill the promises to the people that you, you, know, you, you campaigned on. I, I think there's we we have to get around that. We have to we have to rise above that and look at things not from the point of view of an industry you're trying to save or an industry you're trying to grow with your name on it. Offshore wind fits that for sure. What we need to look at, we need to view policy, especially energy policy, from the point of view of the consumer. That's where we end up with the best policy choices. It's, and you know when you think of the consumer in a slightly larger sense, the consumer is also the taxpayer. So it doesn't make sense to sort of subsidize the consumer at the expense of the taxpayer. Let's look at the all-in cost of the system. I can nerd out about this all day. That's something we haven't really done. It's, it, we do policy by these incremental steps. You know, let's, let's add a little bit of this, add a bit of that. We don't really zoom out and say, you know, I, I've been pretty critical of FERC for not going back and saying, well, we did this whole restructuring experiment going back to the year 2000, how's that worked? Do we have good answers on which parts of it worked, which parts didn't? Should we emphasize this, de-emphasize that? There's very little curiosity in terms of the overall cost and the, the impact on consumers. And there's very, the consumer voice is very weak in this space. Matt, you probably deal with those kinds of issues all over the country uh, in your state public affairs issues. Sure, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that those types of issues are front and center. I mean, I would say that that for for our members in particular, one of the challenges is is they have to go to regulators, right, in in order to raise prices, and so um, that really caps what they can do from an innovation stage as far as research and development of resources and, and emerging technologies and that sort of thing. Um, I will highlight that states are starting to move in a direction where they're creating opportunities for utilities to come before the commission. And places like, you know, Dr. Laffer talked about Tennessee earlier. Tennessee is another place that's that's doing that. Uh, Tennessee, Virginia uh, did a bill last year where uh, they have, have sort of opened the door to utilities coming in and saying, hey, we want to do hydrogen or renewable natural gas projects, and we want to talk to you about how we can fund this um, and, and do rate recovery. So those opportunities are slowly but surely starting to to move i think in states but you know it's good. there's going to have to be opportunities across the states in in order for that to to really take off i think right now they're just isolated examples great um, i want to open it up to some questions but i have one more question that i don't want to get lost here and it's for this audience um, and particularly for the business community in new jersey what advice what suggestions do you have on what the business community should be doing, what they should be asking for, um, and what in, in general should customers here in the state of New Jersey be doing or asking about or for of their decision makers, their policy makers, their regulators? Travis? Well, so I, I looked at the, uh, this, is a, this is a crazy name, the Energy Master Plan EMP, not to be confused with an electromagnetic pulse, which destroys the grid immediately. This will just destroy it over time. So the, but, but the, if, 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 if you look at the brochure itself and it's very glossy and it looks really nice, it says, well, the incremental cost of this policy is going to be, and it's like, you know, the cost is going to go up anyways. It's only going to be slightly higher than otherwise. There is so much BS baked into that, that I, I think that would be the first step is just to unpack it and to show, just show your math. I've got some math. I did the math on, so the Energy Information Administration publishes sort of the capital cost of different types of projects. Offshore wind in this part of PJM, uh, I just took that figure and took the amount that the governor wants to build. So 11 gigawatts times, I forget the exact amount, ends up being over $70 billion. So if you can hide an amount as staggering as $70 billion in a single state by doing some fuzzy math and putting it in a, a, a shiny report, I mean, the first step, it, it, all, it goes back to transparency again. Like, if people really want this, look, if, if 
addressing climate change costs $8, I'm in. I'll give you eight bucks right now. If it costs $8,000, I'm gonna have to think about it, Rick. I mean, it's, but, but that's the question is if, if you take that 70 something billion dollars, divide out the number of people in the state, it's about eight grand per person. That's not even per household, that's per person. So do we really want to be paying that amount for this project or this series of projects? Um, it's, it's a transparency question. And if you think you're doing the will of the people, be transparent about what you're doing and ask them if, if that's really what they want to be and, doing. And I presume by extension, it's, it's transparency on the entire cost of everything the customer's paying for. Yeah, right. so it's the project itself, it's the transmission. Of course, we don't have transmission offshore yet, so there's all of the offshore transmission you'd have to build. There's all sorts of things that go into that, but yeah, it's, it's, I, ideally transparent for all of it. And by further extension, all sources, like uh, customers should be asking for transparency across the board and no matter how they get their electrons, as David said, I would think, right? Right, and I, I mean, so if we can zoom out a bit, I think the ideal case is the governor is not going and picking your energy sources for you. Uh, you either have a market to do it or you have it sort of bubble up through a, a consumer choice paradigm. But in, in no case should a governor be choosing the, the energy source and also completely hiding the cost of his actions. David, your thoughts? Yeah, just to echo the transparency point, I, I think the, the thing is the Back in Texas in, in February of 2021, when they had the big crisis down there and people wound up getting $10,000 uh, power bills, what, what is one reason they got those? Well, one reason they got them is because they didn't have any visibility into what the, their power was costing when they were actually buying it. There is a lot that could be done to, uh, to empower consumers to have greater visibility. And so not only transparency as to what policy decisions cost, but greater transparency as to what consumer actions are ca causing in terms of costs. We've done nothing in the power sector to, to activate the demand side. All, all we've done is, is say, people just consume whatever you want and we'll, we'll have a power system that responds to that. That's worked for a long time it's not going to work. Well, actually, it can continue to work at a really, really high price in the future. Um, the other thing is, Rick, I would, I would, and you touched on the reasons why the compet, why the the um, competition was brought to the power sector. Just as a reminder for everybody, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, in 1996, in a five to nothing order, Democrats and Republicans both opened up the transmission system to bring competition to the wholesale power sector in the United States. Why is this? It was a revolt against the, the decisions that the utilities and the regulators had made in the past that had saddled them with massive costs, the wrong set of resources, the wrong guesses about the future price of natural gas, wrong guesses about technology curves. If um, Competition is something that we have to make sure that we maintain in the power sector. And actually, it's a corollary to the point Travis was just making. We can't fault, we, you know, I mean, you all know the saying, you know, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I think that uh, we need to, to ensure that we continue to have the right set of competition, the right set of private risk sharing on, uh, on decisions in the power sector if we're going to have a have a have an efficient and consumer friendly system going forward. Great, Matt. What should customers be asking for here in New Jersey? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think tra transparency is a good answer, and and transparency with respect to to proposed policies, right? I mean, we we know just from a fact set that you know a, a family saves a thousand dollars a year if they're doing all their you know heating, water heating, cooking with natural gas rather than a, a fully electric household. I mean, that's those are our baked in costs that, that we're all aware of. And so we should be transparent about that from a policy making standpoint when we're being prescriptive about policy. I think one of the challenges right now is that we're not beginning with the end in mind. We're beginning with the prescription in mind and we all know what happens to public policy when that's when that's the starting point. Um, and you're seeing that play out. I mean, we we saw that play out in, in some of what came out of New York this week. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. We have time for some questions. Rick, uh, great uh, uh, program. 
Uh, and I think you might know what I'm about to ask. Um, I'm the resident of a small uh, shore town where I happen to be a councilman, and uh, the offshore wind transmission line is unilaterally designated by the state to go through my little town. Uh, just coincidentally this morning, I watched on a webinar, uh, Rowan University had an offshore wind conference, and uh, there they had two people that you and I are very familiar with, good people. One is the head of a large utility in New Jersey, and the other is a senior official in a large state government agency. And uh, they both mentioned my town by name and said that our town is a great place to have this transmission line come through. So I don't want to be parochial or uh, you know, ask, have a micro answer, but if there is something that's not repetitive where you could answer, why is that good just for my town, for other area towns that have already uh, stated their concern, not that they're against it, but they think there's not enough information, and why is that good for businesses and residents throughout uh, the state? Thank you. Well, let me try to answer as best I can, and I'm glad you kept that anonymized because you've got a sitting commissioner of the BPU here in the room, so it was probably just as well you did. But as you know, that process went through a competitive bid process, and um, uh, there, amongst various uh, alternatives was selected, and, and that ended up partly in, in large part through your town, and that's the reason for it. Uh, the, uh, I guess the way I could answer that is by saying, if you're going to have offshore wind, the reality is that transmission line has to come somewhere. Unfortunately or fortunately for you and your constituents, it comes through your town. I know it'll be managed, hopefully managed safely, which I expect it will, but that's the reality of it. This is a new world. If we're going to have that offshore wind, it's going to be coming onshore someplace, I think. Again, I don't want to be parochial to me. Yeah. I just wanted to, one thing I, I, I meant to mention both. Though they, they both said it was great, and again, they're good people that I respect, but no one has come to our town from any of those entities to talk about why it's a good thing, and they are talking about transparency. That they should. <laughs> they should come and explain that. Hey, Rick, David, if, I, if I could just, the, the, the point about siting of, tra of transmission, and again, the uh, anywhere is, and, and your question, of course, points this out, is an incredibly fraught exercise. Um, and yet, the, the numbers of, of the amount of transmission that is going to have to be built, not just you know, uh, for bringing uh, power from offshore wind. I mean, we're talking about massive, I mean, massive amounts of transmission that have to be built. Across the get, country. Across the country to get to the, the, um, the carbon reduction goals as modeled out by some of the different modelers that have done this. And I think the, there's the, I mean, building transmission is, it's, nearly impossible. Um, it's not impossible. It can get done. Um, there there are actually are a couple of very uh, of big lines that are getting built in New York right now. But getting, uh, getting lines built throughout the country, transmission lines, they take years and years. And of course, I have all sorts of litigation. Same for natural gas. Yeah, it's yeah. Pipelines. It's, 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 pipelines are, of I course, mean, the exact. It, 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 right. Yeah, it might, pipelines I mean, might be even harder. Might be even harder at this point. And the, the irony of, of all this, right, is that we want to do all these things. But you can't build anything anywhere at any time at this point, right? Yeah. And so until we fix that problem, a lot of this is a theoretical conversation. Yeah, yeah so yes. can I tack on to that? Because it's really, I want to ask or focus on the, the permitting process, which is, which is the biggest bottleneck in the transmission, whether it's a pipeline or electricity. I read one long pipeline needed 15,000 different permits mm to get Could started. Uh, Federal, and, state, and local. And local, yeah, because every community has, has their own or their most. But is there a fix to that permitting problem? Is there a national fix that can make it more, more, more sensible and take less time? Because you're talking about five, eight years to build a, a new major transmission line. Well, so, so, I hate to jump in on this, but of course I've got thoughts about this. Um, you know, hey, David, we got about five minutes, so keep this the, one short. <laughs> when, it, when it comes to natural gas pipelines, under the Natural Gas Act, the Federal Natural Gas Act, if you go and get a certificate to build an interstate natural gas pipeline, you get the federal right of eminent domain along with it. There's 
there's nothing like that on the transmission side. I mean, you know, with the exception of different things within the Federal Power Marketing Administrations and some certain other stuff like that. But believe me, those don't apply in the, the, that way any, anywhere here in, in New Jersey, the way it might apply in Wyoming or, or, you know, Colorado or something. But I think the even aside from eminent domain, obviously everybody hates the idea that eminent domains ever going to get exercised on their property. Um, but you've got the even in the natural gas context, even where that authority exists at the federal level, it's it's nearly impossible to get a get an interstate natural gas pipeline built these days. I do think that some of the folks who have always been in the business of opposing infrastructure now actually want to get infrastructure built primarily on the renewable side and are having to kind of live with the, the a bunch of this law and the rules that have gotten created and, you know, Turnabout is fair play. I mean, you know, I guess. I mean, that's a that's a tough thing to live by. But I, I whether or not permitting reform gets done, I mean, I don't know. Travis and Matt, you you'd have a better sense in Washington yeah, they, about they, that. So, the the environmental groups have created a monster, and now the monster is turning on the things that they want to build. Uh, the thing that I'll note though is that you know, as as much as you probably don't want to hear from folks coming from your state capital saying, "Hey, I'm going to put this here," and you don't have too much to say about it. Imagine someone coming from DC and saying, I'm gonna put this here and you don't have much to say about it. Uh, I can't imagine, and this the scale of the change I think is gonna be very different. So for example, if we were talking about doubling or tripling the gas pipeline infrastructure in the US, people would rightly be very concerned about the eminent domain authority that the federal government already has. That's exactly what people are talking about doing on the transmission side. And people are talking about giving the federal government eminent domain authority on the transmission side. That should scare everyone. That that is, I don't think that I think that policy is a non-starter. Uh, I don't think I'm going out on a limb here. But that that's it's it's been floated, and so that's you know we have to keep our guard up. All right, we're gonna have to wrap this up. But Matt, last words about this issue? Yeah, I'm a state affairs guy, so there's no way I'm gonna say anything. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, because the states have Cause, rights. Because the states right now have rights on their transmission. Okay, side. fair enough. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are going to have to wrap this up. I want to please have me welcome the, or, or congratulate the panelists. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us today.